Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history. I love history. If you love history too, this is the channel for you. March 29th is an auspicious day in the history of the United States of America because on that day in 1804, President Thomas Jefferson signed into law what would turn out to be one of the most important acts in the history of the United States Congress. An act that represented not just a political shift of the time, but also which represented a demographic shift that would transform the nation and set us on a path to the future. All for the low, low price of just $30,000. And so today, the History Guy is going to review the importance of the 1804 Act entitled an act to regulate the laying out and building of a road from Cumberland in the state of Maryland to the state of Ohio, the United States' very first federally funded national road. The origins of the act actually go back to the Treaty of Paris in 1783. That was the treaty between King George III of England and the United States that officially ended the Revolutionary War. Among other things, the Treaty of Paris stipulated that the land northwest of the Ohio River and south of the Great Lakes would belong to the United States. This area, which at the time was called the Northwest Territory, represented more than 260,000 square miles. And all of the modern states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. One of the most significant questions of the huge Northwest Territory was how to divide that territory up into states that could join the Union. And the first of those was the state of Ohio. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson signed the Enabling Act, which called for the admittance of Ohio as a state of the Union as soon as possible. And while it took another year for there to be an agreement on the exact borders in order to create a state, the 1802 Act was still important because of a provision in the Act that said, that 2% of the proceeds from the sale of federal lands in the state of Ohio should go to the construction of a road to Ohio. The act that Jefferson signed in 1806 appropriated funds from that fund, and it was the very first time that Congress and the President had agreed to actually start to build a road. What the act allowed Jefferson to do was to hire three commissioners at a rate of $3 a day who would survey a route from Cumberland, Maryland to Ohio Territory. They were required to put a marker plainly seen on either side of the road at least every quarter mile and at every road turn. The road was to be four rods wide. In addition, they could each hire a surveyor at the rate of $2 a day and two chains people and a marker each who would make $1 a day for an entire appropriation of $30,000. But the road that they were using was not exactly new. It had been used by Indians for generations. And in the mid 1700s, a Delaware Indian chief named Nemecolon was contracted to help turn one of these Indian trails from Maryland to the Ohio Territory into a road large enough to accommodate freight wagons. Then in 1755, British General Edward Braddock led an expedition up the Nemecolon Trail. The goal was to defeat French forces in the area and claim the Ohio territories for the British. The expedition didn't work out very well for Braddock to give you an idea. The ultimate battle in the expedition was called the Battle of Braddock's Defeat, and he himself was killed. But the expedition, which included British soldiers and Virginia militiamen, widened the Nemecolon path into a military road. And that was the first improved road to cross the Appalachian Mountains. The new road authorized by Jefferson would generally follow the Braddock Road. Significant work on the road, however, didn't actually begin until around 1811, when the first contract for road building went to a man named Henry McKinley. The law called for a roadbed that would be 66 feet wide and stripped of all trees and brush, and then have a road in the middle 30 feet wide. The road would be built using a construction process called macadam, named after Scottish engineer John Macadam, which uses stacked layers of progressively smaller rocks, which are then all crushed together with a large metal roller. While macadam roads solved the problems of ruts and mud that could come from just plain dirt roads, it was rather expensive. An 1812 report to Congress reported that the cost of building the macadam road was varying between $14.50 and $22.50 per inch. The rocks were broken by hand with a hammer, 
And in order to make sure that you have the right size rock stack, the workers had to fit the rocks through progressively smaller steel rings in order to complete their backbreaking work. It was also not quite as permanent as they had hoped. Even though Macadam is a strong road, the effects of weather and traffic could still wear the road down. And by the 1820s, Congress was appropriating almost as much to repair the existing road as it was to build a new road. In 1818, the road reached Wheeling, which was then in the state of Virginia, and that opened a path for mass migration of settlers and goods to the new state of Ohio, and also a path to navigable rivers that allowed the settlement of the entire Mississippi Basin. In 1839, the road reached its western terminus in the town of Vandalia, Illinois. At that point, it seemed like Riverways, canals, and trains were the future of travel, and Congress could no longer sustain the cost of maintaining the road. And so the road and its maintenance were passed over to the states, and the last federal appropriation ended in 1840. But in that time, the National Road was used by hundreds of thousands of settlers in order to drive American expansion into the new states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Today, U.S. Highway 40 follows much of the route of the original National Road, so you can still drive the road. Although it did bypass a few sections, so there are some pieces of America here and there where you can still see remnants of the original National Road. With the interstate highways that we have today, we take for granted that there's a federal role in subsidizing infrastructure for interstate travel, but that was not always an easy agreement. The early Federalists, who were championed by Alexander Hamilton, perceived a stronger role for the federal government, and part of that was the idea that the federal government would subsidize infrastructure. But they were opposed by the Democrat Republicans, who were championed by Thomas Jefferson, who thought the federal government should have a restricted role, and some of whom thought building a national road was downright unconstitutional. Ironically, it was the law signed by Thomas Jefferson that ended up creating the national road. But the issue wasn't really resolved until something that was called the Era of Good Feelings, which was the administration of James Monroe from 1817 to 1825. Monroe ran and championed something called the American System, which, among other things, embraced a federal role in building transportation infrastructure. And in doing so, not only did we open the American West to expansion and create an amazing feat of engineering, but we resolved some of the thorniest early political issues regarding the size and scope of the federal government. And that resolution still impacts us profoundly today. And so if you hop on an interstate highway, you have reason to commemorate the date, March 29th. I'm the History Guy. I hope you enjoyed this edition of my channel, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to 10 minutes long. If you did enjoy, then go ahead and click that like button on your left If you have any questions or comments, please write them in the comment section and I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of Forgotten History, then all you have to do is click the subscribe button on your right.